It's working? Okay, thank you. ¿Qué tal? Good morning, everyone. Buenos días. Buen día. Tengo profesor de portugués aquí. Bonjour. Nous avons un professeur de français. Oui. Bienvenue. Welcome everyone to the Observatory of the Spanish Language and Hispanic Cultures in the United States. Welcome to the Cervantes Institute at Harvard University and welcome to this Teaching Foreign Languages workshop. This is the first, the first workshop of several activities of training for teachers we are presenting in this academic year in the Observatory. My name is uh, Francisco Moreno Fernandez. I am the executive director of the uh, Instituto Cervantes at Harvard University. I'm sure that many of you know very well what is the observatorio and what, what we are doing here, but uh, let me say a few words about the Cervantes Institute in, in the world and about the Cervantes Observatorio at Harvard University for those of you who don't know us yet. Cervantes Institute is a worldwide uh, non-profit organization created by the Spanish government in 1991. It is the largest organization in the world concerned with the learning of uh, the teaching of Spanish and it maintains a presence in 44 countries and 86 centers devoted to the Spanish and Latin America culture and Spanish language. The mission of the Instituto Cervantes is to promote the teaching, study and use of Spanish language as a second language and to foster the Spanish and Latin American uh, cultures throughout non-Spanish speaking countries. Cervantes Institute and Faculty of Arts and Sciences, uh, Sciences of Harvard University have created the Observatorio of the Observatory of the Spanish Language and the Hispanic Cultures in the United States. So the mission of the Observatorio is to create and execute a program of projects uh, and activities for the analysis, the reflection, the discussion about the presence of Spanish language in the United States and its uh, relation to the international sphere as a first, second, and foreign language. The program pays a special attention to the contact, uh, the contact of Spanish with other languages, especially English, to its presence as a majority and minor minority language in uh, different environments, and to how this language is perceived by the speakers, especially uh, as a, a factor of identity. The observatory conducts analyses, studies, and reports concerning the social and linguistic state of Spanish language and its communities. And it is a forum for research, <coughs> exchange, for debate among experts from Harvard, Harvard University, from other uh, universities in the United States, uh, Spanish-speaking countries, and Spain. Um, furthermore, the observatory organizes on campus and online seminars, conferences, debates, among other cultural activities. So, and also we organize teaching foreign languages uh, workshops like this. This is about the, uh, the competent teacher. We will be here until 1.30 p.m., uh, more or less, and uh, at 11, more or less also, we'll have a coffee break for having a coffee, some beverages, and some sandwiches right there, uh, right here. And by the end of the workshop, uh, we'll distribute a certificate like this in which, like this one, where you have to write your names, that's it, okay? By the end of the, of the workshop. So, we are very lucky because um, for this workshop we have Richard Bueno Hudson, who is not very easy to reach at all. <laughs> Richard Bueno Hudson was born uh, in Leicester, England. That's why Richard and that's why Hudson he has studies in linguistics at the University of Oviedo in Spain and Aston University, Birmingham in the, in the United Kingdom. He has long teaching experience in the classroom of Spanish and English and uh, as a trainer of teachers. He has uh, participated in national and international conferences and doctoral programs in different universities in, in Spain, in the United Kingdom, in Brazil, in Peru, Mexico, Canada, Hungary, Belgium and the United States. He has also coordinated international distance uh, learning projects in Spain and in the United States. His areas of research and expertise focus on the acquisition of the teaching and se of second and foreign languages, as well as in the field of phonetics and language varieties. 
He's deputy academic director of the Cervantes Institute at Madrid, at the headquarters of the Cervantes in, in Spain, where he's, uh, he's uh, responsible for the organization and development of several crucial projects for the Cervantes Institute. Under his direct supervision, uh, Cervantes prepares and organizes the certificates of Spanish as a foreign language, uh, the program for learning uh, Spanish online, the AVE, AVE, the program of training for teachers, besides the general coordination of the academic activity of the Cervantes worldwide. As I said, we are lucky for having uh, Richard Bueno uh, with us today, and I hope you enjoy very much this workshop. Thank you very much for coming to the Cervantes Observatory at Harvard University. I'm Professor Richard Bueno. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> if you're ready for the ride, we can start whenever you want. OK, thanks, Paco. Uh, the distribution of the classroom is a bit weird because um, it's, it's done on purpose, by the way. Uh, I've got you all in groups of six because I knew there were 30 people coming. And because I've got three activities where I want you to work, it is a workshop. It's not listening to Rich's boring story, a life story. It's just workshop on competences. Well, I've got you in six ta five tables sorry, with six people around. So whenever we start an activity, you can turn around and put your thinking caps together, dance around it, and see if you come up with great ideas. OK? Good. So uh, uh, mm, the first thing I want, well, this is basically why the, the reason why I put this uh, slide here with three different documents that Instituto Cervantes has been working on recently in the past few years, which is relevant to the case, basically. It's, uh, as uh, Francisco Paco was mentioning before, sorry, it's difficult for me to call him Francisco. We go back a long, long time. So what Paco was mentioning is that in the academic department at Cervantes Institute, uh, we've got four different departments. Uh, so we've got the teacher training department, we've got the academic uh, and syllabus and organizational uh, department. And then we, we have the uh, certification and accreditation department. And then we've got the Hispanic Society uh, department, which is very interesting. I'm, I'm sure I'll give you a run through of the website when we finish so that you can know where to go and get uh, more information and uh, download uh, resources and activities that might be useful for your classes or for yourself. Um, so why? Uh, this belongs, basically, these three documents belong to the teacher training department. Well, this, these are European projects where some, ta some, some of them are exclusively from the uh, teacher training department of Instituto Cervantes, and some, which are the first two. And the second one is a European project, which I want you to uh, become uh, famili familiarize yourselves with because it's very interesting, and you can use it in your institutions just uh, it, that's the uh, being the European profiling grid, which is very relevant to the case here, and which can give you a lot of insight and new and new uh, views on the competency levels of the different uh, teachers from the point of view of the institution, of the teacher himself, or the teacher trainer, if you want. So, let's go back. These will be the three stepping stones that will join the coherent thread of what we have to say today, basically. The red and white one, informe de investigación, que es ser un buen profesor de español. Eh, las competencias clave del profesorado y la parrilla del profesorado, which I don't like to use in Spanish because it makes me hungry, parrilla. <laughs> I feel like eating a steak or something right now. But it's, so the profiling grid is the name that, the European name that we've got. So before anything else, I'm going to start you off with an activity a community building activity so that I get to know you a bit better. But I just need to know something. I'm doing this in English. I was asked to do this in English, but I don't know. I'm having doubts about my English right now because I went to, I, I ordered a coffee five minutes ago and they said, what's your name? And I said, Richard, and I had to spell it out literally because the, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what's your name again? And I said, Richard. And, and they said, how, how do you spell it? And I said, R-I-C-H. Oh, and I said, oh, Richard. And I said, yes, that's right. You've got a beautiful accent. And I said, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't get me very far, does it? I couldn't even get a coffee. <laughs> Well, don't forget about this one because um, forget about this one because when we talk about the different uh, facets, let's say the different layers that we envisage students, the three, the tripod basically idea of a student. One of them is a student, a learner as a social agent, uh, because they have to interact and communicate within a society. Well, I, I, I was a failure before asking for ordering my coffee because I mean. I was speaking, but I wasn't interacting. If you see what I'm saying, I just all of a sudden I splurted out my name, but I didn't even think if I was doing it in the right 
at the right speed, if uh, the pronunciation was getting across correctly. No, 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 I just wanted my coffee, for God's sake. Well, give me my coffee. And I just said Richard, and I was not interacting or mediating. Don't forget about those two terms, interaction and mediation, because that is something, now that I'm linking it to com uh, teacher competences, uh, you'll see that those two are new elements in the teacher and learning uh, of second languages arena, basically, and uh, the four skills are now part of the past. Now we've got more different skills, language skills, and one of them would be mediating, one would be interacting. Okay, so enough for the moment. I'm going to start giving you some activities. Uh, okay, um, the other thing is, I'm not sure, I'm not very sure really how com um, the Common European Framework of Reference friendly you are, but or savvy you are, but are you going to, this is going to be a trial test, I'm going to give you a, f a set of uh, questions basically, and you are going to grade yourselves mm -hmm. in the different levels of the framework. In order for you to do that, to be able to know whether you're an A1, B2, C1 or C2, obviously in your second language, not in your ma mother tongue, obviously, because this could be, this is a good exercise, because I mean, if somebody has French, Portuguese, uh, Italian or Chinese as a second language, the, the real, the nitty gritty and the real uh, idea behind the, the, common, the framework is that no matter how many years of language instruction you've received, that you should have the same level or you should, your level should show really, in the, oh, sorry, let me rephrase the whole thing. If in order for you to have a particular common European framework level, we don't take into account the number of years that you've studied or anything. It's, it's based on what you can do linguistically. So if I studied Chinese, it would take me like forever. I don't even want to think to reach an A2 or B1. But if I studied Italian, for example, it would be quite easy for me, if you see what I'm saying. So basically, and how do you know exactly what level of the uh, framework, common European framework, and know that you guys over here I'm more familiar, obviously, with the ACFL standards and levels, but this is similar. We'll see how they, we see where they fall when we see two, uh, two sets of uh, competence levels uh, confronted. But this is basically a description of the can-do statements that will enable you. I mean, this is very rough. This is a very rough sort of uh, uh, charting of your of your competence levels, obviously, because I am. Because uh, just take one seat there and just in any, any other chairs over there. There's one at the back there. <laughs> You're welcome. So anyway, over here you'll see the set of guidelines uh, that tell you exactly where your level falls. So it's just a simple, I mean, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to give you a certificate based on what you write here, believe me. I'm just going to let you work around and play around with the uh, different level descriptors. Okay? So in groups, let's see. First of all, work on your own and then describe within the group wh what level you should have in your lang second lang or foreign language according to the descriptors. Let's see how we do this. One, two, oh, there's somebody missing over here. So basically, just let me interrupt you for one, one second. This is what you've got in your hands right now, which is the, this is the profile. If you have a look at the difference between the, the classical skills we used to talk about, which is speaking, reading, writing, and uh, listening. Now we've got new, we've added new instruments of certifying or assessing the different levels. We've got, hold on a second, yeah. You've got the common European framework, framework of reference levels. It goes for, it's a, it's a six layer uh, outline there. You've got A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Basically, so that you can feel comfortable about this. This would be na native speaking level. So. Uh, uh, a lot of native speakers would shy at C2 exams sometimes, I'm telling you. Uh, then you have the different, the different skills, listening, reading. We've, I've included interacting. I'll, it's like me and my coffee this morning. Yeah? Speaking and writing. So those are the ones you're going to assess uh, your levels for. And skills, there you go. And then this is what it should look like in your, in your own case. I mean, it could be, you could be a C1 here and a B, A2 here, and in spe speaking, you could be B2. Basically, that's, uh, that's what I want you to produce right now and discuss it in, within your groups. So if you don't understand any of the can-do uh, statements, uh, the, the, the reason why I'm insisting in the can-do statements is because it's a very positive way, a reinforcing way 
to produce, instead of being negative in the sense that you could not achieve this particular goal, linguistic goal, it's you can do this. Eh? So that's, and you build upon the can do's, not on the cannot do, right? My, maybe my, this is my second language here, but I'm thinking even for your first language, your native language, you're getting familiar, like to, even today, like mm. you said, that getting familiar with the accent, well, I guess, but that's right. kind of hard. I know, yeah, well, that's why, what, what's, that's why defining in detail a C2 level is very, very difficult, very difficult. Because, uh, because I mean, it dep it, there's a lot of, s the higher you go on the scale, the more subjectivity there is there. Even if you have the two, the analytical and the holistic scales to, to, to assess whether he's a, a C1 or a C2, it's very difficult. It's easier on these levels because you've got... And probably like, the, like that, which you, which you mitigated, oh well, this was mitigated with, with uh, some time to get familiar. Because like when uh, my, my sister went to Ireland, I mean, English is our native language, it's like, like what happened with you? Hmm. Well, look at the schools at the beach or something. Like, what? <laughs> Yeah. Some, you know, she goes, they were speaking English, but I couldn't understand. I know. Them. Yeah. So, but if with time you can, and you say, oh yeah, that? yeah. So that yeah. would. Of course, yeah. but I mean, when you assess somebody's le competence level, you have to assess it at a particular moment. There's no sort of. I mean, it, it is good for improvement purposes. I mean, you still need to perfect these areas, these specific areas. But I mean, that's what assessment is about. At this, at this okay. moment. Okay, but no, she says, oh, like she said, the students with the beach. She said, what? And, and he said, the stone. So oh, okay. that means within two seconds, she, oh, just a clarification, then you understand. Yeah, that, but I mean, in an exam, I don't think you would have time to sort of readjust that sort of thing. But I mean, but that would serve. That's the, that's the useful and the positive values of examinations, for example, because in that sense, she would be creating strategies to understand. Okay, so she would probably... In her in her head, not 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 purposefully. She she would be saying, okay, so if stones are stones, then I suppose that bones would be boons or something like that. So she's creating some strategies of recognition and identification of sounds, inadvertently. Oh yeah, yeah. It's all patterns in languages. It's all patterns. I mean, everything reproduces itself in different ways. So, so could she still be here? I mean, she could still be there, but yeah. within this level, she would be here rather than here, for example. That's, this is just an example of the holistic uh, um, sort of description of the, of, the, of the different levels and the different skills. But I mean, this opens up into 17 different frames. It's, uh, it's a very complex thing to be able to build that. that was, uh, but, it's, but it's very interesting, I think. <laughs> no, not at this stage. We're doing something from that. We've done a lot of the, the research is based on that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You've got, you've got all excited about that. That's great. You're producing, you're creating. Some of you are even levitating, I can see. Whew. Grab them down, staple them to the chairs. Come on. So I was being asked a couple of interesting questions there. Who can reach a C2 level? Basically, who the hell can reach C2 level, basically? A native speaker? Not always. That was what we were talking about. Not always. It has to be an educated native speaker that is familiar with different types of textual input, for example. <laughs> okay, or uh, or it could be a non-native speaker that has an extremely accurate, uh, let's say, control of the language and is familiar with or has studied all these different situations, contexts. We were talking about over there. Somebody mentioned and brought up into the conversation also the uh, fact that there are some things that are difficult to teach and to learn, like humour, irony, sarcasm, for example. It's not. What you can produce freely and easily, it's what you think you can produce and you, s you just sort of l launch at somebody's face that is creating a problem. So being a C2 level user, is, uh, it takes uh, much more than knowing the language, the, the grammar, the syntax, and the pronunciation. It's all the different things that are part of the teacher's competences, we'll see, uh, that you need to master as well and work on. Uh, uh, are you with me? Right? Okay, so you've been working in tables. I want to hear some results of the differences in um, uh, what languages you chose. And uh, some snotty nose in one of these tables said, I need an extra sheet because I speak five foreign languages. And I said, oh, shut up. I said, but anyway, yes. <laughs>
anyway, they'll pay for it sometime. Anyway, so uh, so what can anybody want? Do, would you like to share your experiences on this? Does anybody want to be the first victim to? Okay, there you go. Everybody, listen. Hello. No. No. Hello. So he's not a C2 competent speaker because obviously he can't even <laughs> get his message across. It was fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Hello. Okay, good. Is it working now? Okay. So uh, I, the language I picked was French. And I have for... The listening part, I had B2. Uh, for the uh, reading, uh, C2. But then uh, for the parts that are more uh, more active, uh, like you mentioned, the interactive, I just put uh, B1 for the interacting, uh, speaking B1, and for the writing B1. OK. And uh, what does that? That diagram, that chart you drew there with, uh, with the different levels, which yeah. would look some similar to this, for example, as a teacher, what can you do with that? What, does that? what information does that give you? Well, if that was the case of a student, I would have to, um, based on that uh, assessment, uh, to consider some of the activities that would help the student to move in those areas that's, that needs to, mm -hmm. to address that need. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um, from there, you would take courses of action so yeah. that the levels would be higher yeah. and more yeah. levels. So okay. focus more on those parts that the student needs to develop more, and the ones that uh, mm -hmm. they're already in, uh, in a certain a higher level, uh, maybe helping to move more to those areas that are not. Okay. So what's your name? Sorry? Wilson. Wilson. Okay. So that's what Wilson, let's say, valued of his levels, uh, so, sorry, skills in French. But he's also taking like a teaching standpoint there because he's also uh, obtaining from that information, not just a score, but he's also uh, being told that he, there are some areas where he could improve. And if you think about that, when he improves those areas, you need somebody on the other side, which is a teacher, to guiding towards the, let's say, for example, to patch up what he needs patching up, basically, in French. So um, think about these things when we talk about the competences, because the decision a teacher needs to, to make when he's teaching is based not only on the contents of the course, the curriculum, mm. but on the performance of Wilson and his, his buddies uh, in the classroom. Well, and also from the student point of view, if you're aware of the parts that you need to focus on, you know what you need to actually practice and, and study more. Exactly. So if you're yeah. really good at it, uh, maybe you should focus on the other parts that you feel weak. And so, uh, yeah, sorry. And I guess the tendency is to do the, the things that you like the most and you feel are good at, try to do more and more. Right. And so even the, the parts that you actually need to work on. So a competent teacher, totally right there, I agree, would be, would be paying attention to what Wilson and the whole class excel in or lack, let's say, the, the, the competences or the skills that they lack or they needed remedial work or new tuition on to create, to change the course of the, work, the teaching materials or the learning materials so that they met the requirements of him and the rest of the class. Then classroom management and dynamics would be in full force also, in full action in the classroom because he would need probably to divide the class into different groups according to the skills and give them the appropriate and the corresponding time and materials. I know it's difficult. You have to juggle all these things together to be competent, but we'll see uh, how to do it uh, uh, in a moment. Would you like to share? Somebody else would like to mention their own case? Over there, yeah. feeling that re uh, receptive is going to be always m much easier than productive. So I'm looking right away, oh, the top is receptive. That's, they're going to be able to score higher in that. That's going to be easier. And the bottom is going to be more difficult, except for um, uh, <coughs> writing is as productive, too. That the, uh, that the listening is, yeah, no, all three on the bottom, right? They're uh -huh. all productive, that they would naturally be more difficult. The productive ones would be more difficult. I mean, that's my prejudice. Well, well, your prejudice is totally wrong because uh, 
receptive skills are more, more difficult than the productive ones. Yeah. Uh, when you, when you, thank you very much for that. Uh, when you're using a language, a second language, you have no control of various things, such as the speed of delivery, such as the pronunciation, such as the background noise, such as, I mean, when you construct your own, when you create your own sentence, you throw it back, whip it back at your listener in whatever way you can. And it's his problem to decipher it and to d decompress it and to analyze it. You've done your job, honey. You've just done, okay. Hmm? And you choose your own language. Hmm? If, if somebody say, for example, if somebody says to you, for example, ooh, I'm ravenous. You might not even know what ravenous means, but if you say, I have very hunger, the other person is going to understand you. I'm not saying that your production is perfect. I'm saying that you've communicated. But basically, productive uh, language is easier in a way. You take your time to construct your own sentences. Somewhere in there, you've got a little garden of gnomes choosing what language to pull up and use. Or if you don't know the pronunciation, there you go. If, listen to my coffee ordering this morning. I did my production fine. She didn't understand a thing. And it wasn't my fault. Well, it could, could it be? Yeah, it was. I mean, what I'm saying is I haven't got a language impediment. That's what I was trying to say. See what I'm saying? So basically, I know that there's people that prefer to do uh, recept receptive uh, activities, and they think, I mean, you, pe pe that's, people tend to think that because they tend to think that normally your passive repertoire of uh, linguistic repertoire is larger than your active repertoire. That is true. But that doesn't mean that you can control in a second language um, uh, more things when you're, when you're receiving them, when you're listening to them, than when you are producing them. So there's the inco... In normally in the past it used to be mentioned, I mean, they used to call listening, uh, uh, used to class it as a, as a passive uh, skill. The passive skills and the active skills. No, no, <laughs> no. You have to decode in a very fast way with a lot of difficulty because you don't have control of all the different things that are happening around you. All the information that has been encoded by somebody who's taking assumptions that you understand this. The speed, the lexis, the topic, for example. Uh, it, it might be a topic you're not, you're not very comfortable with, but it's been thrown at you rather than you throwing it back at them. Do you see what I'm saying? But anyway, but that's interesting that we, from this little chart, you can uh, get all these uh, bits and pieces of information then we haven't even mentioned in this little uh, confetti, really, of a conversation, the, the, uh, the, the, the social, the, the linguistic varieties of the language that can be thrown at you. If you listen to, to a text, for example, that is, has got slang in it, that has got... Slang also can be divided sociolinguistically in different things. I mean, is it your own geographical variety slang, or is it somebody else's? Because then, is it your own age group slang? Is it... It's um, difficult. Being a listener puts you in a more uh, difficult position than if you are the speaker. And reading and writing is the same thing. That's not saying that when you, when you speak, you're going to produce a perfect message. But that's not your problem. <laughs> it's the other person's problem, isn't it? OK, now, interesting. Well, hold on, hold on tight to the, uh, these two sheets, because uh, after the... Mm, First session, we're going to have a look at the uh, the correspondence with the ACFL levels. I mean, I'm not that familiar with them because I haven't used them. I mean, I've been uh, I've been sort of fiddling around with them, but very lightly. But I mean, uh, somebody has taken the pleasure and the effort to do that, and there's a little scale there that, in fact, in uh, in ACFL, there's one that we don't even have, which is uh, something like novice minus one or something like that. We don't even have that, but. Uh, we go straight to A1. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Okay, let's go on. So now that we've got the first element in the, in, the, in the blender, we've got the first element in the blender, which is we're talking about levels, we're talking about skills, we're talking about foreign languages and levels of competence. This is from the side of the student, basically. We, let's start talking about students and teachers then. No? how these have evolved in time and, uh, well, aged, ov obviously, but uh, also evolved in their techniques, their methodology, their learning anxieties, etc., etc. And let's, for example, think about the past. 
we were mentioning the common European framework, and that is, uh, if, you've, if you draw a timeline, you'll see that it was born in the year of the Lord, 2001. Okay, so anything pre Marco de Referencia, pre framework of reference or common framework is different. A new explosion of activity happened, intellectual activity happened after the, um, the, 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 the birth of the common European framework, but a lot of activity and action happened before, was building up towards that. But what happened like 20 years ago when we were in a classroom? And we had students, all of them looking at us. It was, couldn't even think about having them in groups, for example, having, having them say their own words and having their own opinion. No, no, no. Students were there to listen to the teacher. And the moment you, in, you entered a classroom, all you had to deal with was learning, your, learning by rote all the, the lesson plan and the lesson contents and deliver it. And students would normally take down what you said and would follow you with the guidance and activities, etc. And basically, basically what you had to deal with was with their attitudes or their profiles or their personalities. Have a look at this. This is 1978 from Modern English Teacher. So uh, it gives you a snapshot view of what you would have in a classroom, for example. You would have the, the troublemaker. You would have a perpetual problem. You would have, uh, I'm going clockwise, the sly one listens and only speaks when spoken to. Those are quite annoying too. Mm. Mr. Know-it-all, you can get rid of those easily. That's easy. Okay, the clueless chatterbox. I'm just too shy. Mm. Don't know, don't care, and what? Please don't insult me. It's far too easy. The classy yes, but. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, these are the problematic students you would find in a class. And... That really was a pain. It interfered with your teaching. Why do I have these people here? I want A students all over the place. Why do I have, well, this is what you found in a classroom, probably. OK? Now, as time evolved, you see situations similar to these, right? Everything has changed. I've just, I've just come back from a, I had to give a lecture in one of, these, in one of the master, master degree courses we've got in, in Spain. And honestly, I couldn't see a person's face. All I could see was this, the heliport and, and, the, and, the, and the, the cover of the iPad or the computer. And it's really quite disturbing because it's, it's, it's my problem in this case. It's not their problem. They're doing their own job correctly. They're following in the, the new tendencies and the learning styles, and they've adapted themselves very well. It's me that I'm a, an old fart that sticks to the old techniques. That's, that's the thing. So what do I have to do? I need to be competent in those skills. Ooh, we're getting competences already. I need to be digitally savvy, for example. And I need to be fami familiarize myself, not only with my iPad and my iPhone and all my devices and who, how cool I am. I'm one, one of the gang because I, I deal with these things. But I need to start teaching in this way. I need to start teaching in a way that my, the devices help me connect with the students, not the other way around. For me, the first time I saw this, it was a problem. I could only see barriers. I didn't, for example, I, when I was last in Manchester, for example, the last class I gave, it was a C2 class. Of all classes, it was a perfeccionamiento class. So I was dealing with language varieties of Spanish, and I was dealing with pronunciation and uh, phonology. So what happened? It was the first three sessions were an ordeal. It was for me, for me, not for them. They were having fun. It was, I was teaching adults, by the way. So until I got the hang of it, and I knew, I learned, that I had to get them to do the nasty work at home and select the materials they wanted, that they were uh, happy with, comfortable with, and they presented them in class. And it was all about blogs. It was all about um, well, I mean, the blogging activity. <laughs> it sounds like a bloody activity. Well, the blogging activity was exceptional outside the classroom and inside the classroom. But... It, uh, what, what it did was it, it made me switch my, th uh, my, my brain in, into a different thinking mode because I said, okay, this is going to take from me different working times, for example, because I, they would do the, 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 their assignments at 3 o'clock in the morning. I didn't care. I received that in the morning, but I needed to know that within my planning, I needed to devote some time to receive what, he, what one of them was presenting offering to present, rather, was in tune and was acceptable uh, 
for the next lesson plan that incorporated my teaching. So he would be doing some, let's say that we were talking about, for example, Colombian variety of Spanish. They would decide what to choose from YouTube, from a commercial or from a film. They would analyzing, uh, analyze it according to the structures and the instructions that I'd given them about the specific, uh, uh, the specific uh, features of that variety. And they would present it in the classroom to the rest of the classmates. Well, that, I mean, was just baby steps compared to what we're doing now. But, but for me, it was quite a challenge to see that somebody was literally giving me the material to assess, to value, and to give them the OK to sort of use it in the next class to teach their classmates. So this is, has got a lot to do. And it helps in, in a way. It helps if, if I promoted this rather than the pen and paper class and the, uh, the record player, the video player, what have you. Mm. To me, it helped me sort of level down or iron out the, let's say, the uh, attitudinal problems that we saw in the previous slide. Because obviously, they were part of the learning process. I was engaging them, another competence, I was engaging them in the, their own learning process in a way that they felt comfortable about what they were de doing or saying. And it was useful for me because it all, at the end of the day, it helped me from not spending hours in front of YouTube and saying, acento colombiano, eh, ejemplo de no sé cuánto. No? I, was, I was receiving all the information from them. Sometimes, OK, I have to admit that it wasn't, it wasn't this quite right, but uh, it wasn't the, a, a true representation of what I was looking for. But as I whipped it back like there's no tomorrow via email just so to their own letterbox. So they just I saw, try this one, for example. This is, this is a bit better to explain with positive reinforcement and with you know all the tacts of the world and lovey-dovey. And they, thought they, they, they felt, A, being catered for, being lo looked at and being listened to, and B, that the, what they were doing was, was creative and was positive and was useful for the class context. Is that, does that make sense? OK. So um, this is basically how student, this, the figure of the student has evolved, thanks to the common European framework. Why? Because at the very beginning, it was a very student-centered document. Hmm? If you think about teachers, the situation I mentioned at the very beginning is a teacher, obviously, was the one that threw at them, literally, poor little containers and recipients of, of information, he filled that, uh, res that, that, that box with information that they had to digest. Hmm? This case, it's working in different ways. And the common European framework tells us that a student has three faces. He has a face as a social agent, which means that a teacher needs to create activities that uh, lend themselves to teach that person to work in a, social, uh, in a social atmosphere. So it's not only knowing about the language, it's knowing how to use it in a social context. So he was uh, the student as a social agent. Then the second aspect would be student as an in intercultural uh, le user, learner, because obviously, remember uh, the cultural problems that you might encounter if you're not uh, if you're not really familiar with the cultural settings you're working in, or as, a, or as an autonomous learner. So it's social agent, uh, intercultural speaker, and autonomous learner. Why? Because think about the, uh, think about the activity that I was mentioning before about the, uh, the accents of the different varieties of Spanish. You have to involve them, engage them in their own autonomous learning, because you have to make them capable to progress when you are not around. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So being autonomous, I mean, these are beautiful words, autonomous learner, intercultural speaker, social agent. But that puts pressure also in, uh, on the teacher, because it's the teacher that needs to create situations and activities that, that support those three, those three aspects of the student, right? So. These little terms are floating in the air. Uh, we'll catch them later in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit, and we'll see what happens. Now to the teacher. Originally, the teacher was Mr. Know-all. It was the volcano of providence and knowledge, spurting linguistic lava all over the place for those little recipients to fill up 
with that lava, which would en enable them to, to use it, supposedly, not to get a coffee, but for something else. And it was say, no, say nothing, complain nothing, and use everything and produce everything. So that was the basic situation. As time went on, as time evolved, people in the 90s, early 90s, uh, started uh, thinking about a teacher in a different way. A teacher had to have a lot of different skills to perform different roles. Some of the skills were behavioral input. You came along with it, with them. Some of them were mm, action or out, output that they would produce in the, sh in the shape of, uh, of activities and skills, for example, or, or uh, activities or performance. Right. So let's have a look at the different, uh, the different roles are the ones that are underlined that they thought about, because these are kind of going to come in handy for your next activity where you have to describe competences. So the teacher was seen as a diagnoser, as an informant, as a motivator, as a conductor. OK, there you go. And as a corrector. That's one idea. It doesn't have to be there. There could be more than these. But I mean, these are the ones they thought about. But listen, this is very interesting, because they also think about personal attitudes and more sort of inherent to their own personality, role types. We see the uh, teacher as somebody who changes positions depending on the students they're, mentioned, they're talking to, the paternal authoritative figure, the maternal affectionate figure, or the fraternal permissive. OK, mm -hmm. I'll let you go this time because I'm too busy trying to put out a fire on this side of the classroom. But I mean, the next time, I'll be a bit more, more authoritative than now, if you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. OK, or for example, motivator, competence and confidence, language ability, etc., clarity of thought, different things. And they also mentioned what to do and what not to do. Right? Don't ridicule. Don't be sarcastic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not that's not going to help the learning process at all. Right? So, from being a person in the middle of a classroom where he literally threw at everybody, showered them with knowledge and, and information. Now we see that a competent teacher needs to perform different roles. Right? Especially in a world where everything changes. Right? Part of the urban landscape, we used to have telephone booths <laughs> and travel agencies and uh, video stores mm -hmm. or CD stores. Now it's all Netflix and it's all Amazon and it's all, and honey, if you're not with it and if you haven't got your credit card and you're not computer friendly, you're out. And your new watch. Mm -hmm. New what? Uh -huh. Honey, so, so, oh, this, we used to call this una bacaladera in Spain. It used to massage your credit cards until they just, just shredded them to bits. But anyway, yeah. Now you don't have them. But I mean, if you, if you ask somebody, we're not, we're not familiar with them anymore. Well, it's some places and they're remote. But anyway. So why am I showing you this? It's just an idea. Something happens. Something happens in the middle of nowhere. A new, ten, a new in, innovation, a new product, a new scheme spurts out of like a mushroom like a mushroom in the middle of a field all of a sudden it disappears and you don't even remember that it existed but you have to jump on the innovation bandwagon or you're out so this means that teachers need to need to follow the new trends and need to use use them wisely to be able to help their teaching methodology and the teaching scenario from, now, from, from this, at this point, I just want you to have a look at the following competence definitions and discuss them very, very briefly in, a gr in, in groups. Have a look at all the, see how they relate to one another and see what the differences they are. Just read them and discuss in groups very, very, very briefly. And you can tell me now. Can you see? Can you see a coherent thread between them? I mean, it's different views, basically, on the same thing. But, uh, but, uh, and the the interesting thing also is, don't forget that the framework was born in two thousand and one, 
And look, people were thinking before and after this, they were already sort of sponging around all the information and, run, and talking about it, discussing the different aspects. And obviously, everybody talks about their, their own story. I mean, when, when I show you the, the documents that we produced after all the research, for example, it obviously is very Instituto Cervantes oriented. Obviously, we did all the research with our students, with our teachers, with our managers, with our directors. And we're talking about a specific, um, specific document for a specific situation. This is totally applicable to everybody's situation. And these documents that we produce, which are all fully available online, you don't have to buy anything. That's an interesting thing I'll tell you later. They're, they're, they're all very good for you to uh, adapt and implement. These are ongoing. I mean, new things will crop up, and we'll be able to sort of insert them in the different competences, etc. That's why we hold uh, uh, not only us in, at Cervantes, but at the European Commission and European Union, we this <coughs> work groups and focus groups and all sort of research going on all the time. So if, if you see this, this is the 2010 result or 2012 result of the research project. But in 2020, it'll be a completely different story. We will have developed on this. But yeah, oh, let's concentrate on this one, which is the one I, was, I wanted to uh, show you, basically, which is where we, oops, where all our studies started, basically, which is... Uh, the attitude to effectively face similar situations. Some people call, call them family of situations. Some, basically, it's having the skills ready. Mm, there's something, I'm, I'll say this one in Spanish because I like using this one. Is, el más listo no es el que más conocimientos tiene, sino el que mejor hace uso de los recursos que se tiene a su alcance. Well, basically, it's the same thing. It's once you've gone, once you've, uh, you've uh, uh, confronted or you, you've been faced with a particular situation, somewhere deep in your brain, there'll be a mechanism that springs out and that will tell you what to do because you'll make use of this uh, skill, this experience, and this automatically. Well, that is being, becoming a competent teacher. What it means is uh, being ready to use all the different, the battery of, of skills and, and actions that you've already used for different things, applying them to a, a, a new situation that has resemblance to the one that you've used in the past. See, see what I'm saying? So, so that's why it's to effectively. That's the word. It's all the go. Effectively, yes. That the, the attitude to effectively face similar situations, face and confront, basically, and resolve, using multiple cognitive resources in a fast, pertinent, and creative way. Knowledge, skills, micro-competences, data, values. These are inborn, most of them. The, the rest are acquired. I mean, you might be as boring as anything, uh, but you have to teach yourself to be look lively in class. If not, you're out. Oh, okay. And perception, assessment, and thought patterns. Yes, are there any questions on this, or do you want me to carry on? Well, I just think about not just similar situations, like all new situations. New situations? Yeah. New situations are normally made up of different bits of all situations put together in a different context, basically. And if not, that's another skill you need to do. What to do in an emergency case? You can either panic, like when my thingy went wrong, or you can either just pretend that, <laughs> pretend that nothing happened. <laughs> Plus, oh, sorry. In the classroom, it's usually, you're usually confronted with new situations. Yes, but normally, if you think about it, deep inside them, they're, they're all old, oh, yeah. turned into new sort of uh, situations because the person is new, the, uh, probably the activity is new, but you've been piling up with your experience different ways of solving these problems. Maybe you don't even know about them. When, when we see the list of competences and, and sub-competences, you'll start saying, oh my God, I do this all the time. Oh, so that's called cognitive. Oh, well, you live and learn, don't you? Yeah, well, it's basically like that. That's the idea. You do, sometimes you do because it's, it's inherent to you, it's innate, or you've got, you've got the skill or the hang of things. Some others, you need to learn how to do them. There's no two ways about that. OK. Mm, well, different views on the, same, on the same topic, basically, that help one another. So the common basis of the framework. Why is it so important to us Europeans? Uh, and how do we make use of them? Let's see. When the little earthquake finishes, I'll let you know exactly what it is. Okay, it's a common basis, it's a framework 
with, re with relevant information for everybody, all the different actors on the teaching, learning, second languages stage and scenario, okay? So it's, it, it gives transparent and coherent information for level, compet competence level uh, recognition throughout the whole world. Obviously, start, uh, first European, but then it's expanded all over the world because in some of the uh, student exchange programs or, or university entrance levels, they ask these, they refer to the A1 to C2 common, common European framework levels. So it's, 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 it's accepted all over the place. Because of the different layout of, of the actual document itself, it's good for students because it, they know when they dig their claws into it, they, they know exactly how to study auton autonomously and what exactly they need to know to become proficient in a specific level. It's good for course designers because obviously they need to know what to fill those white pages with if they need to be able to uh, sell or, the, in, or market their produce or their products into the market of teaching and learning markets. It's good also for designing programs. It's also good for publishers and for teachers. It gives them gu strict guidelines. It never gives them orders. It just tells them, really, it bases it on, on questions rather than on, than on statements. It really lets them know they set out about doing and they ask questions about the learning and teaching process. They don't give them assertive st statements. Uh, for governments, designing curriculums and curricula, and for examiners, designing exams and certification bodies to set the standards. Basically, it's good for absolutely every member of the language teaching community. See, so that's what, what the framework says in the introduction. We have not set out to tell practitioners what to do or how to do it. We're raising questions, not answering them, which is a very comfortable way of saying, yeah, you've got the information in your hand, but really I'm letting you know and <laughs> under the counter what to do. But it's very good because uh, it's, uh, in, it defines in different grids and charts. That, what I gave you at the very beginning, is just a simple sample of uh, the holistic chart of the can-do definition statements. But uh, really, if you start opening the book, it's... Uh, uh, it's it's it really it's never ending if you read everything thoroughly because it's so information packed that it's amazing. <coughs> Let's see. So it's a common basis for language teachment, teaching and assessment. Sorry, without imposing. That's another good good thing that it doesn't tell you what language methodology methodology or approach you need to take, as long as you reach those can do statements. As long as you can. You're comfortable with those statements. It also, it's good for benchmarks to chart the progress because it's the same levels and for different institutions can set out their own graduation targets. And it also bridges education systems and employers across Europe and beyond into the international arena. So basically that's the main purpose of the, uh, of the, uh, of the framework. Not only, it's interesting the way, the, the name of the actual document is the Common European Framework of Reference, and then it's Learning, Teaching, and Assessment. So remember at the very beginning that I said that it was very learner-centered at the beginning. Now, after 2006, six seven, everything started being more guided towards teachers. The teacher portfolio, the student teacher documents, all the teacher training documents, the European Profiling Grid for Teachers of Languages. So now we're covering, it's like a tricycle. If you get rid of one of the wheels, you'll tumble and fall. You need to make sure that everything is balanced. So let's see how it works. Well, the content, obviously, it's what students need to learn in the language, of the language, to communicate effectively. Those competences that need to be deployed and need to be built up, like all anything to do with knowledge, skills, and attitude, which activate strategies and get you to use the language uh, in, a con in a social context uh, after you learn it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like a wheel. You learn new elements, you use them in a context, socially, culturally, independently, autonomously. You have to build up new strategies. And while you learn, sometimes this is all unconscious. Sometimes it's perfect guidance from the teacher, the competent teacher. Um, and the, 
everything has to be done through communicating activities, communicative, sorry, activities. If you have a look at the different communicative activities that Framework wor uh, mentions and works with, it expands on the traditional four skills of the language. It's listening, it's reading, it's writing and speaking, but it's interacting and mediating. If you look, for example, at all the certification uh, f uh, samples in Europe, if you look at DELE, our, our diploma, the Diploma Español como Lengua Extranjera, we don't, we, originally it was all about the four skills, and then we started introducing, now we don't see uh, escritura o lectura, or, sorry, or, or we don't see oral, expresión oral. It's always expresión e interacción oral. It's always expresión e interacción escrita. So we need to see the interaction and the mediation factors in action. If not, you would just be talking to yourself in front of a mirror with no disturbance from your interlocutor. It would just be you talking, which is okay for a madhouse, but I mean, anyway, in, in, in the real world and in, in the daily life activities, if you want to get a coffee, you need to pronounce your name properly, remember. Okay? So really, the competence levels are good because the, everybody needs to know exactly what the target is to accept it and recognize it. Mm -hmm. Useful for recognition of achievement. Okay, if we go back again in time and we'll have a look at the four different skills, it's quite a different story. Whoops, see, you've got the spoken language. That's the speaking and the listening. And then you've got the written language, which includes writing and reading. And then, my dear friend, what's your name again? At the back, yeah. Anne. Anne. So you've got the receptive skills and you've got the productive skills. Hmm? Again, remember, uh, unless anybody wants a fight and wants to claim anything uh, uh, contrary to what I said, receptive skills are more difficult. Thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see the dimensions. How, do we, how does this materialize or crystallize in, in, into a document? I mean, how do we put these together? Well, we've got the vertical dimension and we've got the horizontal dimension. It's got six levels, as you remember, I mentioned before. We've got breakthrough and waste age. Those are A1 and A2. So that's, that, would be, that would correspond to the basic user. Then the independent user would be threshold and vantage. And then effective operational proficiency and mastery would be profici proficient user. And then sideways, you've got all the different skills and competences and strategies that are, have not been described here because obvi obviously I, I don't have time, space, or I would need three boards to sort of split into, into coherent sections all the different competences. But this is basically what it would look like. Hmm? which is basically what I gave you before, but in a, in a smaller chunk on uh, the horizontal and the vertical dimensions of the framework, the scales. This document you can also uh, download. Uh, that's what it looks like. And, and this is what it is, a common framework to teach second languages. Hmm? Originally created for 47 countries of the Council of Europe which is divided into six levels, which provides a basis for the mutual recognition of language qualifications, for teacher training, for language learning, for everything. Each country drafted uh, specifications for their own language. This, remember, the blue one was 2001. And the outcome of this work, it was translated by us, by the way, into Spanish in 2002. So 2001 was <coughs> created. 2002, Institute of Cervantes translated it into Spanish, and the, the outcome of the work was known as reference level descriptors, the work that every single institution or in different languages produced. They expanded absolutely everything. These were a bit more basic guidelines as to where things should fall, and then we at the Institute of Cervantes extracted and pulled out all the significant bits that were just vaguely mentioned, and we typified everything in writing, and we, uh, we created what we call El Plan Curricular del Instituto Cervantes, which is the following. So the, the, the um, reference level descriptors for Spanish, A1 to C2, were developed by Instituto Cervantes. We were the first. I'm 
and have to say proudly that he's one that was the first institution to create this into their own language. Because uh, what we did was this document, which you can download also online. Um, I'll show you the, uh, the links later on. And it was basically the explanation of what the Common European Framework was giving, the guidelines they were giving, we created absolutely all the specifications for the different levings, levels for uh, learning and teaching, right? This is for what it is, basically. 2,000 pages, three volumes, six levels of progression. <laughs> it's a brick this size. And this is what it's useful for. I mean, you can use it for curriculum development. Institutions and, and government use it for certification and recognition of accreditation. School boards also in the classroom. You orient your classroom techniques for the specific level following all the different guidelines. Textbooks, portfolios, resource materials, international language credentials for recognition, then for teaching, for learning, and for professional development. By the way, this is the website where you should go to download the, the text. Let you have this later. Council of Europe. Full text. Okay. And uh, oh, Ginny, I can I can let you have it later on. You can copy it later on. This is uh, obviously where you go, the Council of Europe. And if from our website, you can download the, uh, the Common European Framework, the Plan Curricular, sorry, with all the different preliminaries, references, right? And this is, and this is what I promised before, the correspondence between the actual levels and the common European framework level. See if that makes sense to you. See, for example, this level we do not have. We start here. You've got novice low, which makes a lot of sense, but uh, it's a different way of structuring. Uh, right? Akfel has a new one. Oh. Distinguished, that goes further up or what? So it's C2 plus or something like that. Hmm. Recent. Okay. Good, good. I need to, I need, need, need to look into it now. So you mean that, that means that you're a, a genius, basically, in the, <laughs> in the profession. Okay. So they've got eight levels then. Two, four, six, seven, and then eight with a new one. I'm being told that Akfel has introduced a new level, which is... Uh, distinguished. distinguished, which would probably fall here on the C2 plus, right? Ooh, interesting. Okay, so um, I'm just going to show you one more slide. I'm going to change on to the, the, do the preview of what we're going to, well, the presentation of what we're doing now, which is the three teacher training documents from Isidro Cervantes. We'll leave that for the second part. The research projects that we you can also download from uh, this is what we're going to be dealing with in the second part of the uh, of the presentation of the workshop. In 2011, we decided that we wanted to run an, uh, a research project called Que ser un buen profesor, una buena profesora de lenguas. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. I'll show you how we did it, what we did, and that led to the second document, which was the competences the key competences of language teachers, which also interacted. We were then called or summoned to join the European team, which was led by Equals and CEP from France, with 11 languages were dealing with the same uh, different institutions, with a project called the European, Pro the European profile, Profiling Grid, which was a way it's an interesting tool to assess, self-assess, and in, well, 
really to promote uh, different uh, attitudes, different skills, and different uh, futures for, for students, sorry, for teachers of foreign languages. It was interesting. We'll have a go at this. And when I say a go, we'll try to have a go uh, per se, because I want, uh, we're going to do it online. We're going to just run a little, a little experiment online and see how we uh, classif uh, classified as far as our teaching levels, which is interesting. And all this was this is still a future project we're doing now we're trying to create the certificate for teachers of foreign languages what happened there we couldn't create that if we didn't know what specific teacher specifications we, we need to need to hold on to and we didn't we couldn't build the or write the specifications if we didn't know what competences teachers needed so it goes backwards so it's a bit of a domino effect of the different research projects that we did that are enabling us to produce this for 2000, sorry, 2016, if we, uh, because a lot of institutions are getting involved in the same project, so it's making it more interesting, but at the same time, diff more difficult to get together to uh, dis confront and uh, exchange the information and trying to fall on the same, land on the same base uh, when it comes to different, uh, different aspects of competencies and uh, what's the other one and the specifications this is the first remember if you go back to the previous slide we let's go back I told you that we ran a couple of uh, experiments and research pro projects the f this one was what is a good teacher or a good foreign language teacher for you and what we did was we had uh, different work groups uh, groups focus groups and the uh, surveys within our, in, our Institute Cervantes network around the world. And it created havoc, I'm telling you, because we were clever enough to not only do the, ask teachers about this, we ran focus groups with students, with, uh, off, uh, with our offices administrators and directors. So everybody involved, from the receptionist to the director, to the head of studies, to the students, had some say in the matter. So it wasn't uh, just the teachers bullying the whole thing, the whole story. It was everybody's point of view. And that's interesting because when you see the competencies, you'll see that some of them apply not only to the teaching techniques and the knowledge of the teacher, it applies to their involvement in the institution, which is interesting because, uh, and that's quite innovative from Instituto Cervantes' point of view because obviously we understand a teacher as part of a cosmos, of a literally of, an, of a whole civilization that encompasses teachers, students, uh, even, even things like uh, professional development programs. It's, uh, everything is part of that whole system. And the teacher does not only have to individually and uh, unanimously take, uh, be, be worried about his teaching situation, but he needs to know about uh, peer observation. He needs uh, t to to be about uh, deal about uh, what's out there in the world that can help my students progress in the self uh, assessment pro uh, process. So, for example, in the in the autonomous learning process, he needs to get involved in absolutely everything. He needs to be able to give information about what's out there as far as technology is concerned that could help the rest of the teachers produce quality teaching and quality learning for the students, etc. So we'll see that in a minute. On we go. This was, have a look at this concoction here. When we threw into this beautiful program that uh, really converts into a poster, basically, and it extracts the words that are used the most, and it produces this beautiful thing. This is after the whole work of 575 people around the world, and they produced uh, documents and documents that were sent to headquarters in Madrid. These were the words that, uh, well, came up the most. Creativo, desarrollo, personalidad, prof don't let it get into your head, okay? Uh, docencia, cultural, oh yeah, that's me, that's me. Respeto, profesor, equipo. Ah, who's that? Gestiona, buen, paciencia, organizado. Mm, interesting. What makes a good, teach, good Spanish as a foreign language teacher? Any ideas? Oh, everybody was talking five minutes ago. <laughs> What's happened? What? 
makes a good Spanish teacher, a good foreign language teacher? Just start throwing, throwing ideas away. Come on. Okay, helping students to commun communicate, good. Which means, the, thing, the interesting thing that we found out after the research is that every single <laughs> statement of a sort is linked to, ev to millions of different things. So that means cooperation, that means following what the student is doing and, and where he's going right or wrong, De sort of trying to hold on tight to the course of the classroom so as not to let the student she's m mentioning uh, go far ahead or fall behind from the rest. There's a lot going on there. Keep going. Any more ideas? Patience. Okay. And organized. I mean, again, that, that, why you do organized? You know what the curriculum is going to be. You know what you, you're watching the time. You're mm -hmm. going to get done. But you're, you're, you're patient and, and empathetic because you want to have time for questions. Okay. So there you're mentioning quite a, di a lot of different things. You, 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 it's like a... It's like a collection of different things. You're talking about patience, which is an, it's a quality rather than a skill. And so once somebody observes your class and they tell you, uh, mm, okay, I think you should have allowed for more time here for, and, or you should, should have been a bit more understanding when he said this abruptly, you should have. So becoming, being uh, patient is a quality inherent to a lot of people. When you're not, you have to build it. So you have to st acquire it. But you also mentioned planning, obviously. You need to have, yeah, yeah, you have to be able to know when to skip certain uh, activities that you had programmed because obviously you need, if you do them, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna reach the end of the class with the objectives clearly covered. So yeah, different things. And what I notice is I'm not uh, planned or organized but watch my time, but then I become impatient because I don't have uh, questions. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> okay. Classroom management and classroom planning the, and patience and being also a, a flexible, really. You're, fl you, you, you're allowing for flexibility to, 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 be, to, to be in control of the class, not the strictness of what's written on a, on a, on a grid in a piece of paper, right? Yeah. Well, the exam is a different story. Everybody knows they need to do certain things in an exam and they're testing really different things. But based, normally when we talk about exams, we're testing whether you've covered or you've managed to... Uh, control the, uh, the, uh, the, the different elements of you being tested on. I think you want to say something? I would also say classroom management. As one mm -hmm. who works with uh, young children all day long, only in the target language, only in Spanish, because they're learning maths and reading, mm -hmm. um, social studies, everything. Okay. Classroom management and my key to everything else is color coding. Okay. Uh, color coding. Okay. Color coding. And everyone has a particular group. Okay. Because you have to think on your feet with children who, for the most part, do not speak Spanish at okay. home. Okay, so what you're doing is you're introducing different things here. You, mm -hmm. you, w w w when you talk about things that might l sound loose or from the main point, they all connect. They all make sense. For example, color, c color, coding, what you, color coding, what you're doing is you're trying to give an extra aid to students to be able to map out in their brains where things belong, for example. You're organizing ideas for them, okay? Some people might not be uh, responsive to color coding. They might be responsive to whatever. I used to, for example, use sounds when I was teaching. Whenever somebody made a mistake, when I was teaching English, and, I, and they couldn't, for example, they couldn't get hold of the difference between s and z, I would do the snake thing for the z. I would do, so, so when I did like this, they knew it was the s sound that was going wrong, for example. So those are the different techniques that, techniques that you apply to your different competences also. So, and you also mentioned uh, classroom management also, which is very important, obviously. That gets you to decide whether to use one technique or not, or whether to sort of uh, use it more or less extensively. Anybody else, any ideas? Whoops, thank you. There you go. Um, well, we all not say this, but I think a good teacher is an empathic person empathic, who has yeah. the capacity of l read what the students need because some of them don't say it. So you have to have to read what they need, what they what they are 
the things that they need to know or the thing that they don't they are not understanding and repeat it again exactly so you're putting yourself basically uh, in in the sh in the shoes of the student basically mm -hmm. and what you're doing is you are understanding what he needs uh, and again this is a bit like the uh, this is again like the my name is richard in the coffee scene before we mentioned because i was just not paying attention to what she was understanding or not i was just saying my little piece and uh, was not taking into consideration the student or the recept receptor of my message. Good. Since you've got the hang of it right now, we're going to start doing the activity, which is called What Makes a Good Foreign Language Teacher. First, I'm going to give you a piece of paper here, one of these worksheets, so that you can jot down your interesting ideas. It says, step one, you can start, just start passing it around. Yeah, there you go. It says, step one is individually think of eight characteristics or qualities that define a good teacher and jot down your answers. <laughs> okay, second part of the exercise is now in groups discuss your answers with your colleagues. Try to reach a consensus as to what and no fight please. What eight are the most relevant? <laughs> See if they match. Okay, see which ones match, so those stay and see which ones don't and negotiate. Okay. Maybe they fall into the subcategories of one another. You don't know. So we think about that also, because now when we see the final result, we'll see key competences and subcompetences. I'm not sure what you've written, but I mean it might be that way. It, maybe one of them, one of those is dangling from something else. Hmm. We'll see. discussion on that yeah, 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 yeah. because all that, yeah. that involves many things. <laughs> right. I know you could be working forever. I can see that your heads are like a meter longer in circumference because uh, wider because you've been overdoing it so much. Your brains are like coming out of your ears. So let me know your seven finalist contenders to the competence <laughs> of the teachers. Let's see. Start. I'm not going to even uh, ask you by, by groups. Just let me know who wants to share the uh, the result of the discussion. Obviously, don't tell me. There you go. Yeah, yeah only one per group. No, not one per group. Just read, read the uh, read the result. Yeah. Um, as a group, we determined that the eight most important would be um, adaptability, patience, um, that you're organized, approachable, empathetic, engaging, fair, and passionate. Most importantly, okay, passionate. Okay. <laughs> don't forget, don't forget that most of the ideas that are kind of going to crop up here will be probably the result of people having in mind their own educational situation, not, not in general, as a vacuum. Eh? That's good. And uh, some of them I can see were like uh, character qualities, and some others were more technical qualities. Didn't you? Didn't I? Didn't hear anything about knowledge? Did I? Or I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just. I'm just uh, being forgetful. We actually didn't have time to, yeah. s to speak about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of us had it on yeah, our list, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah but Mabel. <laughs> ma but but Mabel. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah. it's, so in that group it was taken for granted that you need to be a, be a walking dictionary and apart from that you need those qualities to survive. Okay, good. Yeah, that's one thing. Hmm? Next group. Good, good. Thank you. Thanks. Next group. So we also divided the characteristics uh, into we were thinking professional characteristics and personal qualities. There you go. Uh, one, the, the one we wrote first was knowledgeable because you need to know you need to what you're teaching. You need to talk about if yeah. you want to teach something, right. And then a person who's able to convey content effectively. Okay. So convey gives good content. explanations okay. and uh, caring. Uh, yeah. I mean, he under, understands and mm -hmm. so uh, encourages atmosphere of collaboration okay. instead of uh, good, yeah. being competitive, for example. And mm -hmm. uh, he's enthusiastic or passionate about what he teaches, good. and that shows. Mm -hmm. uh, fair. Fair. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of content in each of these descriptions you give. Yes. I mean, a lot of things come out and flow out of those. Being fair has a lot behind, huh? mm. but yeah. And also sensitive to personal and cultural differences. Okay, great. Woohoo, we're getting it. We're getting there. Very good. Over here, somebody's raising a hand. There you go. Again, Hi. don't forget, there's no right or wrong here. It's just we, you, you, we're just filling the bank, the empty bank of ideas, making it sort of complete. Let's see. Um, we have patience, someone who is a motivator, um, a person with good communication and who's knowledgeable, someone who is um, has technology skills, someone who is Ooh. flexible and can adapt easily in the classroom, someone who is competent in a variety of teaching techniques, obviously organized, and then finally a good model and creates a good working environment. Well done. Okay, different things are coming up. I think you've got most of them there. Very good. Over here, we've had, we've ha oh, we've got two more groups to go. Who's the speaker here? <laughs> there you go. So we have been talking about the same as you have been talking, and an interesting discussion here was the difference about knowledgeable and communicator, because while we were thinking that if you uh, know a lot, but if you don't know how to communicate, that's something wrong. So this is the most interesting thing that we can add, and we agree with the rest of the group. Okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Over here. Um, so the ones we have were very similar to the ones that everybody already mentioned. I think I'm just going to add uh, one that uh, is being a lifelong learner. Lifelong uh, learner, okay. No, so learning so have, a have a long-term planning for your education is also important. Yeah. It's and not a short-term Yeah, so activity. The, like, the things that you look at uh, about technology, so don't, don't be afraid to learn new things and uh, adapt it to your and teaching. Them, yeah, yeah. Um, and about the knowledge, uh, so some, some other groups mentioned about being knowledgeable of the subject, but I think also uh, being knowledgeable of the students so all the pedagogy, how they develop, the different stages where they are, the different group ages. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, interesting. So in a, yep. Yeah. Oh, being a good listener. Of course, I mean, they're all intertwined if you think about it. If you're a good listener, that means that you really care about, uh, about how they feel and you really, uh, you're really assessing perpetually and continuously their development process and I don't know if anybody's mentioned mm, accurately self-development concerns about a teacher yeah I mean they've, they've come up but uh, it's it's interesting because obviously being knowledgeable and being uh, patient and being caring etc don't last forever it's like beauty it's it's there somewhere but you have to revive it huh? you need you need to look after it Believe me, I'm 140 and I do a good job looking after my beauty. <laughs> okay, now, still on the same track, I want you to think about this next one. You were all teacher-centered and teacher-concerned, uh, teacher but how about this? 
do you think the rest of the people around you in the institution you work in think the same? They have the same idea of uh, being a competent or a good teacher. Would, you have, would your answers have differed had you been a student? Really? If you'd been the school principal or the uh, dean of the school or the, right? An administrator? Yeah, you'll see in a minute, yes. And you'll see the results. It's interesting. Also the students. Yeah. Okay, don't, don't forget that we have adult students, but it's, it's nonetheless problematic, I'm telling you. It's, uh, it's, uh, sometimes they know more than you. They don't have time. They don't, uh, they don't uh, accept criticism. I mean, there's pros and cons of having uh, children and having adults. So... Uh, so it's an interesting result you'll find. Okay, what makes a good teacher of Spanish and foreign language? The three sets, the three stages, the design of the research. Then we'll talk about the data collecting and the results. Okay, so, and don't, don't lose track of what you've written because we'll go back to that. So the tools and participants, as I said, I mean, we have 575 people involved, teachers, students, non-teaching staff, external experts, and we had, we, we brought into the focus groups, we brought in some experts in the, Teacher, uh, uh, sorry, language learning and teaching world. Good, good the gulos gurus came in to, to give their solemn uh, opinion about what we were doing. Uh, and then we have qualitative research tools such as focus groups, tasks for teachers, and tasks for students. Basically, this was happening. You'll see the different parts of the world where this took place, which was quite interesting. And they were all thrown the same question on their plate: What makes a good instructor and this teacher? Okay, so let's see what happened. We also simultaneously had uh, in the focus groups, they went on forever. It was only two hours, but it was so exciting that they l lasted for two hours. But 39 people from 14 different centers in four focus groups were discussing sim simultaneously the same, the same ideas. No? And there you go, in answer to your qu in answer, trying to answer your question non-teaching staff from the main office, from human resources and from academic staff, external training experts and heads of studies. So obviously we're gonna get something weird from the, from the combination of aspects that each one of them thought was more important. We also had group tasks where teachers and students were together and where they were se uh, in, in different places interacting and trying to answer the same question. And the five main categories the, 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 that you'll see in colored boxes are the ones that cropped up. Basically, that was the basis for our next study. We divided the results into the category of teaching skills. Any, everything that had to do was concerned with the preparation to carry out the teaching learning process. Happening, everything happening in the classroom related to the teacher learning process and their training and the knowledge of the professional development. That was the teacher proper, right? Then personal characteristics were very important to the whole group. The personality, personal qualities and attitudes. Team working skills. <laughs> team working skills, I mean, that's no good if you're trying to do some peer work and, and group work with teachers, not only with students, with teachers. Related, uh, the team working skills were related to their work within a professional team, outside the classroom, with colleagues, bosses, and the profession in general. The next one was commitment to the institution. That was also very important, related to the commitment and the sense of belonging to the center and the institution, the center network. And last but not least, these are the groups. Some people over there in a group were discussing different uh, things. I pointed out maybe you're talking about the same thing, but one could be a key competence, the other one could be a subcompetence. We'll see. Cultural sensitivity related to their knowledge, abilities, and attitudes regarding the culture of the country where they teach. Mm -hmm. Right? Can you more or less see where they would fit, the ones you have the eight you selected? Do they all belong to one of these five categories? Could they? 
This was again, again, remember that this is a cascade type of, of domino effect type of uh, research. This was the first one. We, we were just trying to figure out what's a good teacher. Then we built up the, competen the competences from the being a, a good teacher results. Okay, so what did we do here? This was the interesting result we got. That's what teachers agreed on. This is what students did. So this little lilac, little sort of purple thing, box, is the teaching skills. So for teachers, 62% of the effort or the, or the interest had to go to their teaching skills. Personal characteristics was quite important, 20%. Then you've got teamwork was 7%, and uh, institutional uh, commitment to the institution was 6%, and cultural sensitivity was 5%. Don't forget that these teachers are all teaching around the world. So some of them are in New Delhi, some of them are in Tokyo, some of them are in Sao Paulo. So, uh, so obviously, it's not that relevant if you're teaching in Italy, for example, be, being Spanish, for example. But it is relevant if you're teaching in Nairobi, for example, right? where you have to hold back certain topics, certain things, when sometimes uh, uh, people come to class with a different disposition, different attitude, or they might belong to a, to a culture where you don't do anything at all. You expect to be fed everything, and there's no effort on your side as a student. You don't know. There you go. Students, did that differ at all? Let's see. They thought that 50% of uh, teaching uh, well, we should go to teaching skills, but they gave a much higher value to personal characteristics and personal, uh, the attitudinal type of uh, aspect of the. Would that, would that make sense in your context? Yeah. At the end of the day, they want a cool teacher, don't they? <laughs> but yeah, some people have said. I don't know. Okay, so team working skills and uh, cultural. I think this is a better way of looking at this. Look. Now you've got the three agents in action. The lower, the lower row is the administration and, and non-academic staff. This is what they thought. Let's analyze this carefully. Students thought this. That's the, the teacher's point of view. Mm -hmm. So they all gave the preeminent importance, or the most important weight, mm -hmm. to the teaching skills. Mm -hmm. A teacher needs to have teaching skills. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But personal characteristics? Teachers didn't find it as important as students and administration and staff. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. Why do you think so? Why do you think the teachers didn't give it so much weight, or as much weight as the other uh, elements selected? Something you can't change? Or you don't know that you're like that, maybe, well, I don't know. It could be because it's, it's self-reflected, so it's more difficult to, when you're analyzing yourself, the other characteristics. In the other case, it's the students and the administrator reporting on the teachers. But when you self reporting on yourself, it's more difficult mm -hmm. to realize. Okay. It, it could be that they're more dependent on us. Be kind, be fair, be patient, yeah. be nice, and could be. Not yeah. on them. All right. Mm -hmm. in, other, in other words, you've got the upper hand, right? <laughs> okay, what else? Any, anything else? Teamwork skills. Teachers are more concerned about this. Students really. Is it your <laughs> No, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it's they don't value that the teachers work in teams as much as they do. They don't really care, do they? It's, uh, they don't even know about that. Teamwork, and what's that? Having fun? Good. Okay, commitment to the institution. What the hell? I mean, you're my teacher. You are teaching in this, in, inside of this building, but I really, I don't really, they don't, but this is because they don't know, really, because if they are doing a, if they're doing, let's say, a four-year course, and the next year they get a different teacher that has different skills and different attitudes, then they would be worried about that because that teacher would, be, would have been trained 
following certain characteristics and would be involved in the institution would, and there wouldn't be such a hard transition between one to another, if you see what I'm saying, yeah? They would feel uh, as comfortable as they did with their previous year's teacher. And cultural sensitivity, administrators don't find that important. Okay, so after months and months of study, this was the result of what is a good Cervantes teacher. We really had to put in the blender many, many things to get this. Just statistics, percentages, boop, boop, boop. It's a keen team worker, it's down there at the bottom. It's good at interpersonal relationships. Now I'm going to ask you the same question again. Haven't we all been talking about these things all day? Because I've heard you mentioning all of these in different ways. No, you haven't? So basically, sometimes stop and reflect, ponder about what you do on a daily basis, and you're doing the same thing inadvertently. You sometimes don't even know you're using these skills, but now we call them competencies. Huh? It's the behavior side of it. It's the knowledge of, knowledge, uh, knowledgeable side of it. It's the technique or methodology side of it. I mean, you use this all the time in a different way. You need to improve them, some of them, or not. But basically, they're all being used. Wait a minute, you still haven't finished. That is, what is a good teacher? But now, from research results to foreign language teacher key competences. This is the second document. Now we're going to turn that into competences. You're still not hired yet, Wilson. You need <laughs> we need, we, we'll leave that for later. Okay, so, las competencias. Again, you can download this from the website. And this is the categorization and classification of, the, of all the key competences and the sub-competences. So we've got, we've got the, the eight key competences where three of them are going to refer to teaching skills per se and the other five are going to deal with actions that the teacher should get involved with or in the, within the institution. So setting up learning situations, engaging students in their own learning process, assessing students' learning and performance, facilitating intercultural communication. I'm quite happy because I heard in different groups all these things have cropped up already. So developing professionally as a teacher within the institution, managing feelings and emotions at work, taking active part in the institution, incorporating technology at work, incorporating and using, right? These would be the headlines, basically. Now you need to literally write out four sub-competences for each. So you would get eight competences and 32 sub-competences. But because I'm so enrollado and so good, <laughs> so brilliant, I'm going to give them done to you with a little task for you to perform in five minutes. What I'm going to do is, this is what they look like if you have a look at them. The, re the reason why we've done a King Arthur on the round table type of shape is because we don't consider one more important than another. There's not a head of the table. They spin around like crazy. And whenever we need to introduce a new one in the future, when we discover this new one's coming up, it'll be easy to sort of insert it in either the inner circle, which refers to teachers' skills per se, and the outer circle, which is within the institution, like <coughs> managing feelings and emotions at work, facilitating intercultural, or taking active part in the institution. So I'll tell you what the activity is because it's quite tricky. Each of the competences have four sub-competences each, right? You don't take a picture right now, otherwise you'll be cheating. <laughs> okay, take it, but don't use it. <laughs> okay, so each of them, I'll, I'll let you have them at the end, don't worry. Uh, so you've got how they fan out, all the different, all the different sub-competences that come from the eight competences and then each of them really 
are described thoroughly like this. So basically, this is, remember that he had a big pie and a smaller pie. Well, the smaller pie would be this one, for example. Organizar situaciones de aprendizaje. Each of these has four, it opens up into four different uh, sub-competences. And this is the general description. So what I'm giving you now, so that's why I was telling you, don't even worry writing it because you're going to get them here. What I'm giving you is, each is going to have the eight competencies with the dis general description of it. And what's missing is the four sub-competences. So if you can help me dish out these things, and now I've got the, the reason why I had you in eight groups is because I've cut out, we're back to school children, I've cut out the sub-competences for you to, the 32 sub-competences so that you can place in the gaps that you've got in the sheets that I've just given you. I don't know if I've made myself clear with the convoluted explanation, but... <laughs> it's too small. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll you, you you'll see it in a minute. Yeah. What do you mean I don't have it downloaded? No, but you can. Uh, no, no, but I can let you have the slide. Let's see if this makes sense. Check. You can check your answers. Don't worry copying everything down. It's in the website anyway. So you, you, you don't... Uh, Bingo, yeah. When you when you get when you download this, it'll be all explained here, and each one of them will be fully explained. So the main idea here, remember, is that some of them apply exclusively to the teacher in class, and some others apply to the teacher within part of the institution. So even when it says using and incorporating technology, it doesn't only refer to the person in the classroom using a computer. It means using that technology to communicate transversely with the rest of the class uh, teachers, sorry, or the institution, or even using it from home and promoting, uh, well, forums, promoting all the activities that are interconnected. Hmm? That's one thing. Uh, anger, uh, patience, all these words that came up, all those are in the emotional side of it, like, uh, where are we? Managing feelings and emotions at work. It doesn't only mean 
being patient and being considerate and being affectionate. It means not barking bat back at one of your colleague teachers because something is wrong or because they've taught something that you should have. It's uh, being balanced and, uh, and, in, and in control of the whole situation throughout in all the process. Right, let me very, very quickly, because if I'm not mistaken, it is already 11 past one and uh, we are running out of time. Uh, Again, this is what we saw. These are the competent, the competence and subcompetences. And these are the two documents that we've seen. Remember that you can download them. The first one would be what a good teacher is, and the second one, the key competences. This will lead us to go on to our next pro uh, project, which is the teacher standards to build the teacher certificate. You'll hear about us soon. Coming soon. Huh? Coming up in Cervantes. OK, so that's what we've got. And now, very, very quickly, I'm sorry that we haven't got like 16 more hours to yeah. talk, discuss, have fun, go to that lady in the cafe store and say, my name is, <laughs> <laughs> see if she already remembers. And we can discuss the next one, oh, which is the European profiling grid in one second, very qu quickly, because I want you to go online and do it. It's Eddie. brilliant. Yeah. Eh? Okay. She, she, she's done it. I mean, nothing, she's still alive, so nothing's going to happen to you. It's, it's a great experience. But why I'm, why I'm trying to say, let, let me let you have a, a little peek to one of our centers to see what, to see what I've, bl I've deleted, what the, the name of the, of, the cent, of the center, of the office. So this is what some students said about their teaching situation. The teacher, which is quite surprising. I mean, being the uh, deputy academic director, I said, so they, they come to class unprepared? Am I to understand that? That's quite tricky, yeah. El profesor tiene que prepararse la clase antes de llegar al aula y ofrecer una clase variada, ajustada al estudiante y ver si funcionan las actividades elegidas. Okay. Tiene que animar a los estudiantes. Can you see that from these lines, it percolates down to the eight competencies again? Look, tiene que animar a los estudiantes. Los estudiantes necesitan en muchos casos motivación y el profesor tiene que dársela. A bit demanding, aren't they? <laughs> Push, eh? Pushing and shoving, it's not, uh, obviously it's not school students, pero uh, el profesor tiene que apoyar, solucionar dudas, estar disponible y atender individualmente al estudiante. Así como darle retroalimentación. Well, they probably said feedback, I don't know. Eh, tiene que cumplir lo prometido, ser serio, seguir el programa y finalizarlo. So serio, that probably means last year I couldn't finish the, 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 whole, the whole book and now I got, I got flunked in the final exam because we didn't cover that bit. Okay, now let's go. Let's see what teachers said. Let's see what teachers said. Se responsabiliza de su actuación y reciclaje, okay. Cada uno tira para casa. Actualizarse y reciclarse. Uh, retraining, professional development, tiene que ser consciente de sus necesidades en relación con su propia formación. Tiene que mostrar preocupación por la imagen de la institución para dar un servicio de calidad. Ha de estar comprometido con los valores. Los, sí, this, this is the one that deals with commitment within the, or to the institution and being part of it. Tiene que conocer las variedades de español, that's the knowledge side of it, eh, y mostrar una capacidad integradora. Tiene que ser capaz de detectar y analizar las necesidades de sus estudiantes. Tiene que tener capacidad de trabajo en equipo, flexibilidad, disponibilidad. Isn't it amazing that the whole thing boomeranged all the way to the, sa to the same age com uh, competencies? Tiene que poseer capacidad de autoevaluación utilizando herramientas di eh, como el diario de clase, la revisión del programa. Okay, it's interesting. These are the centers that took part in the. So it's a motley collection of centers from all over the world. It's not just the one in Europe and that's it. Okay. And very quickly, I'm going to skate past the EPG because I want you to at least to know where to go and do it because it's brilliant. The other project that we took, but this was, this was a European project of eight different institutions. It's called the European Profiling Grid. I please want you to... Uh, to write down the website where you can do, go and have trial 
try and like samples of the uh, or tests of the uh, of the of the tool. It's very interesting because it shows you exactly a pattern of where you're lacking information as a teacher, where you could improve. There's room for improvement in these areas, etc. But it's a tool that can be used by three different sorts of people. It's for the teachers themselves to see exactly where their skills fall. For teacher trainers, how to develop programs so that specific group of teachers can uh, get training and development programs. And obviously for managers or, or class, or sorry, man or administrators of school systems of, to see exactly how they can interconnect the lack of skills of one school, for example, with the excess of skills of another. There's a lot that can be done, always in a positive way, always for in line with the can-do statements of the Common European Framework, and always as a positive reinforcement and as bringing awareness to teachers, teacher trainers, and administrators as to what needs to be done to mm, perfect the, the, the skills in that specific institution. It's amazing. Look. So the participants in the project, there was a core consortium, CEP, who are very good at, uh, obviously, Le Centre International d'Etudes Pédagogiques, they're very good at uh, certification, especially, Francia. Then we had evaluation, equals, obviously, from the uh, uh, um, Great Britain, uh, British Council, Instituto Cervantes, Optima from Bulgaria, and Le Goethe Institute from Germany. That was the core consortium. And then there were other centers that also uh, took part in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the group, in the research project. Austria, Pologne, Poland, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and Turkey. Those, uh, this is the distribution of the European countries so that you can see where they land. So the core consortium was the blue one. And the green group was for the secondary partners. It was translated into different languages. It was validated and piloted by the different countries, which was, gave it a lot of validity, basically, because the grid, when you d the grid itself has different, ob obviously, the vertical and, and the horizontal dimensions. So the main classification of the vertical dimension is dominio de la lengua. So if you, if you pay attention to this, you'll see that it all also corresponds to what we've been doing with the competences. Formación, that's uh, the knowledge side of it. Then you've got evaluación de la práctica docente, assessment. Then you've got experiencia docente. It's a, bit of, it's a mixture of a portfolio and also a, um, a guiding star, basically, towards uh, uh, improving your, your, your different skills, etc. And then it's got, it's got six phases, development phases, one and two, two and three, two and, sorry, two, one and two and two, three, one, three, two. So crossing all the different elements, you always, you're always going to find in your different skills where you land. Let's see some samples of, obviously it's, it's online, it's free, and it's in different languages, so you can have a go and see, it's very good. This is the one we view, well, I've got examples of each. This is, you can design or decide on the format that you want your evaluation in. It gives you different ideas. This would be, for example, for an institution. We ran these tests with our own people, and the, it's been very helpful from an administration point of view because we've noticed, for example, that a specific center is very high on teaching children, skills for teaching children, for example. Some need some reinforcement in technology skills, for example. Some, it's never used in a bad way, in a sort of a negative uh, assessing, in evaluating or job offering way. I mean, you can use it in different ways, but it's also in a positive way, so as to reinforcing and building up on the skills that you already have. Or, for example, we've connected certain centers that excelled in certain skills because we want them to make to get and get, get together to produce uh, to give feedback, for example, of the research to centres that needed in that specific area the, uh, the the skills or the information. So the higher you land, obviously, the better, and that means that the in this these areas you need to do some work. For example, hmm? this would be different skills. It's all outlined and very e easily uh, understood. It's very good. Let me show you more. The origin, an evaluating tool with an equals. All of us got together. That's the descriptive categories. Hmm? We 
how to increase the quality of second language teaching by means of a flexible tool that can evaluate teachers' competences and assist in their self-assessment. These are all the people that oops, sorry, took part in the piloting. 1,814 teachers, 102 uh, teacher trainers, and 64 managers, basically. Then we also had, for the piloting phase, we uh, contacted all these institutions and uh, that helped us obviously do, this is the distribution of the categories. Again, we're talking about the same thing, training and qualifications, key teaching competences, enabling competences. These are like what in Spain we call transversales. And uh, professionalism, which was the commitment to the institution, for example. And then you've got the different areas. When you start do running the evaluation on yourself, you, it'll skip from one to another. Once you've clicked on this one, let's say, for example, my level of proficiency is, let's say, 3-1, because you read all the descriptors and the bands, uh, and it, it helps you progress to the next one. So when you've completed all, it shows you like a, an infograph, basically, of what you of what you how well you can perform in the different areas and where you need reinforcement. The different levels, the reference levels. It's an innovative tool for foreign language teachers, teacher trainers, and managers, right? It identifies the competences, it showcases the importance of professionalism, da -da, and it improves the quality and efficiency. It's lunchtime, isn't it? <laughs> so it's in nine languages. And there you've got all the competences outlined for you, organized. Okay. Dominio de la competencia. The develop development phases. Then you can save and retrieve, because obviously... It's the philosophy behind the whole thing is so that you can use it in a positive way to build upon what you've already got and not as an assessment tool to penalize your teachers or yourself, but on the, uh, on the contrary, to make sure that you can keep building on that. Save and preview report. So it will give you recommendations for improvement? No, but it can, you can do that. It can give you, gives you recommendations if you go back to the framework and see exactly what you need. Or if you get in groups in your institution, you can discuss those things. Or if you are a teacher trainer, it can, he can provide you with uh, solutions to those. Uh, it's very visual. When you do this as a teacher, you'll see where the huge gaps lie. Very interesting. And, and the, action, the, the course of action you have to take from there is something that you can decide on, or you can ask for advice uh, from the framework or from exper more experienced teachers. So as soon as this is how you choose what category you fall on, you keep advancing from left to right, and then you click on that and you keep going. Diddly, yeah. diddly. Oh, uh, one second. I'll just. Uh, I mean, if you probably if you go to Google and do EPG, you'll find it. It's also mobile friendly for devices, and this is I've got I've got it written down here. Wait a minute. This is a different way of showing it. If you see what I'm saying, dominio de la lengua, formación, evaluación, experiencia docente. Obviously, you can't buy teaching experience, but you have to obviously <laughs> become older than, I suppose, more experienced. <laughs> see, these are examples of the individual ones, the self-evaluations. These are very good for teachers also to do this whenever, when, when, they want to, when they want to, for example, go to a job interview they can prepare themselves by uh, doing, uh, running one of these tests and see what it looks like. This is one we did with some of our people. We just disguised the names. And this is also, if this was your teaching team, uh, you, would, you would have them all in, either in this layout or the other one I showed you before. But it gives you a clear picture of what's going on in the teaching department. See, that's the other way of looking at it. These are some of the testimonials from teachers and uh, why they found it useful. <laughs> okay. 
So even from here, you can extract the main ideas of the competences. Para entender las debilidades del departamento y mejorar como grupo. We get the teamwork uh, facet of the competence again. We get all these things disguised in different ways, but it's the, it's the, say, it's the same old story. It's the eight competences uh, addressed in different ways. Para reflexionar acerca de dónde estamos y marcar objetivos. That's where you would do it. This would be the website. Okay. HTTP egrids.epg project European Union. And now, just very, very quickly, this is the bibliography you were asking about before. This is what we've done. And all I want to say is that if you go to the Instituto Cervantes website, cervantes.es, or if you go to CVC, which is Centro Virtual Cervantes, CVC, dot cervantes dot es you'll you'll see a deployment basically of all the different activities and, and actions we take from teacher training to certification somebody was asking me before we're currently involved in the development of a new test online for which could be very useful for not only a, it's not a diagnostic test but you could use it for that it's like a delay but online, it's going to be uh, adaptive. It's going to be it's going to, it's going to be language variety friendly because we're using we're doing it in conjunction with uh, the University of Mexico and uh, Salamanca, and uh, we are uh, working very hard on that right now. Probably next year uh, we'll have it. Uh, it'll come off the ground, and we'll, you'll be able to use it. Uh, we, we've we've worked a lot thanks to these res these uh, research results we've got from all over the centers of the world. We're doing a lot of, because they gave us a lot of importance and the a desperate need for certificating children's language skills. So we've already put in the market the A1 Common European Framework level for children in uh, the ex examination. And now we've got the A2B1 levels, which are very demanded in different countries, France, China, Brazil, for children. So we're working on different aspects of that. Now, the online, the online, um, the online program AVE, Aula Virtual de Español, is also undergoing drastic surgery because uh, uh, it's gone under the knife. We've been working on this for one year because the standards that was, uh, be, were being used, which was Flash, were not compatible with all the modern technology. So see, these are the things when we were talking about urban light landscape before and that things change so rapidly, they can throw you to the ditch and say, honey, there you stay. Either you update your skills or you're lost and, and, and forgotten. So we're changing the whole thing from Flash to HTML5. And now in, uh, in October, we'll get uh, a new version of AVE for A1, A2, and then B1, B2, and C1 from here to December. So it's, uh, we've cleaned up all the interf interface and we've tr it's the, every, all the activities have been re revamped and uh, we've adapted them to uh, the new technology uh, language, which is uh, different. It has an effect, an impact on the methodology, really, because you cannot do with uh, tools that are not flash certain things. So we have to adapt the speed of uh, the, the, the methodological component within the activities, etc. So it's brand new. It'll come, you'll have the whole system ready in December. Hmm? And uh, also the... Um, uh, very important for those of you. I've, I've brought some uh, some of this, some of these cards, which are for the other one of our other highlights, basically, which is the accreditation of educational institutions dealing with Spanish. It's called the Centros Acreditados. Some of you have told me now in the in the break that during the break that uh, you've seen uh, uh, in Nicaragua or in different places Cervantes Institutes. We uh, to date, we don't have Institute Cervantes in Spanish-speaking countries, but we do have accredited centers, which are centers that have Spanish uh, teaching and learning as one of their aims, and which they meet the standard, they get evaluated and, and audited by Institute Cervantes, and they meet the 700 standards that uh, they need to become an accredited center by Institute Cervantes. So all the information is here because it might be of interest, because we give uh, support, uh, methodological support, and uh, we uh, help each of these centers 
get the, uh, the curriculum in shape uh, if it's needed or give them sound advice as to different, uh, all the aspects relating to the uh, Spanish learning process. So this might be of interest to you. I'm going to leave them here so that you can take them. And um, I don't know. My name's Richard. That's how I started. I think I have to finish <laughs> like this. I hope. I really hope it. I really hope it's been as useful and interesting and, and motivating to you as it has been to me.